I want to thank you for the opportunity to study the Word and the extrapolation of the doctrinal principles from it. May God the Son be glorified as we study together and believers helped to appreciate this unique organism called the Church. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're now, um, I'm skipping some of the material, uh, teaching it here. It'll all be in the book on uh, the church, uh, which uh, we'll get out as soon as the, uh, the copy machine has been repaired. And um, it'll also be as an appendix in the book on Galatians. But uh, this uh, point, uh, Roman numeral 7, in the doctrine of the church, is the church as an organization. Uh, Dr. Richard Clearwater said, quote, Our Lord and the New Testament writers neither coined the word ecclesia nor used it in an unusual sense. Like any other word, according to the laws of language, it might be used abstractly, generically, particularly, or prospectively without losing its essential meaning. In its primary meaning, a church was an organized assembly whose members were properly called out from their pr private homes or business to attend to public affairs. In all of its usage, prescribed conditions and membership are implied, inferred, or expressed. In his definition, he calls attention to the fact that there is an organizational aspect to the local church. And we're looking, we will look at two things under this. First of all, we'll look at the church as a local assembly, and secondly, we'll look at as the church and her organization. And uh, just to remind you, when we talk about this, we're talking not about the church universal to which every member of the body of Christ belongs, but uh, every member of the body of Christ should be a part of a local assembly of believers, a local gathering of believers, which is the local church. And we do know that there's a lot of things wrong with a lot of local churches, but that doesn't mean that we ever have a right to abrogate what God has made. Now, uh, the church meets in a place. Uh, where that is is not necessarily important. The building is not the church. The church is people. And where the people gather, that's where the church is. However, don't base it on the statement in Matthew 18 that says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. That is faulty exegesis of a passage which has nothing to do with the local church. It has to do with discipline, uh, and the discipline uh, that, uh, and uh, uh, when one member of the body of Christ has a problem with another member, uh, the prescribed method of handling it is go to him personally. If he will not hear you, take someone with you. If uh, the, he will still not hear you, then you take it to the church, and where two or three from the church will meet to together as the judge uh, or, the, or the judges, uh, that's what you do. You take it. And when these two or three decide something, it's the same as if I would have decided it. It has nothing to do with worship, it has nothing to do with prayer, it has nothing to do with being together. It's that when they agree on something, it's not agreeing in prayer, as the Pentecostals will tell you. It is agreeing on the judgment uh, that is to take place, and it is also uh, based uh, on uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, which makes it clear that even the least in the church should be able to make judgments like this. The early church gathered in schools, uh, they gathered in large homes of the very wealthy uh, members of a congregation. Uh, they met uh, uh, in uh, the upper rooms. Many of the wealthy homes had upper room uh, uh, for gatherings. Uh, they also met in uh, uh, catacombs underground during the persecution periods. They met outdoors. Uh, they met uh, during the uh, Soviet po persecution. They met out of doors even in the middle of the winter in uh, deep snow uh, wherever it was necessary for them to gather for the study of the Word of God. Neither is the church the house of God as some people call it. Uh, the, God does not dwell in temples made with hands therefore it is, not a it is not a house of God, it is not a sanctuary. 
This doesn't mean that boys and girls are taught to treat the church with disdain. It is uh, a piece of property that belongs to somebody else. And just as they should be taught how to, to uh, uh, respect anybody's property, they should be taught to respect the property which belongs to the local church. Which reminds me to tell you to teach boys and girls, particularly boys, that they never enter a building with their hat on. I'm so sick and tired of ignoramuses walking around as calling themselves men, they're male species, but they're not men who enter buildings with their hat. A man always takes his hat off when he enters a building. And he never eats with his hat on. Never. And any of you parents who ever allow a child to eat with his hat on, you should be beaten with a wet noodle. I'm so sick and tired of seeing this ignoramuses and lack of, of, uh, of respect and lack of manners. I don't know what parents are doing these days instead of teaching their children manners they sit down and stick them before some tube and let them sit there and gawk at the thing and uh, uh, we were uh, uh, we had a joke yesterday that we were going to use on television um, the lion and the and uh, garbanzo and that is what's the difference we thought maybe we'd use it for the for the uh, the clowns then what's the difference between a newspaper and television and the answer was uh, well, you can wrap your garbage in a newspaper, and Bill said maybe we should change it. What's the what's the same? The, what's what, what makes the newspaper and television alike? They both can be used for uh, housing garbage, and they do. It's nothing but garbage for the most part on what you can see. But the point is, uh, I'm so sick and tired of seeing uh, people, kids. I've seen men. And uh, you go to a, a restaurant and uh, you see men sitting there with their hat on eating a meal. What kind of an idiot. That shows that they have no background, no, no breeding. Uh, you don't have to be wealthy to have manners. You don't have to be uh, uh, somebody who uh, is in the top Fortune 500 to have manners. Everybody should have manners. And it's manners when you enter a building to take your hat off. It's manners for a man to hold the door for a lady. It's manners for a gentleman to always uh, show deference to a woman. I don't care if she's a woman's lipper or not. You show deference to a woman. You show respect for women. Uh, but it's terrible. The house of God is not a name for the church. It's a building. But when they enter the building, you take your hat off. When you enter a building, you show respect for the building. That means that the kids don't run around and treat it like it was a playground. They use it as a place to gather for the royal family, for fellowship, for study, for outreach, for evangelism. And when it's time for play, there's, it's playtime. And there's a space, a place for it. It doesn't mean running up and down the hallways. Uh, it doesn't mean playing in places that are not designated for that. At the, the, in other words, while we don't... Uh, venerate the building as a house of God or a sanctuary, we certainly do not treat it with, with contempt. And there are a lot of people who treat the church with contempt as if they didn't need the church. Well, the local church was ordained by God. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10, please. Now, Hebrews, Hebrews is a very interesting book, and you don't understand what's going on in Hebrews 10 unless you understand the whole book. I'm not going to teach the whole book, but let me explain this. That Hebrews was written in 67 A.D. The, in 70 A.D., Jerusalem was going to be totally and completely destroyed under the fifth cycle of discipline, and when that was going to be happening, the temple was going to be torn down. And the reason was because... The Israel had gone on negative volition toward the Lord Jesus Christ. And before he was crucified, he went to the mountain and looked down at the temple. And he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you as a hen would gather her chicks. Yet you would not. That's negative volition. Henceforth, your house, that's the temple, shall be left to you desolate. The Lord Jesus Christ the Shekinah glory, when he left the temple, left it desolate. However, the grace of God gave them about uh, 50 years or uh, 40 more years 
for them to get the truth under the teaching ministry of the church. However, in 70 A.D., the fifth cycle of discipline was going to fall, and the temple was going to be completely and totally removed. During this period of time, uh, the uh, message of the gospel gets out, and a lot of people believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. However, pressure comes from the Jews. Here you have Jews who are born again. Uh, here you have Jews who are not born again. So you have two kinds of Jews, the born-again Jew and the non-born-again Jew. If you understand anything at all about what happens when a Jew becomes a Christian, you understand that they go under the principle of shunning. That is, they actually have a funeral service for the Jew who gets saved. And anybody who is a true a Jew uh, neither can do business with, can neither will buy from nor sell to, nor uh, treat this person here as if he were alive. Which means, therefore, that this person's business is at stake, his livelihood is at stake, his very life is at stake. He can't buy food, he can't sell food, uh, his product, he can't make a living. Uh, he can't be, uh, uh, they can't rent a place to him, they can't sell a place to him. He is a total outcast. Therefore, he's putting his life on the line. And the pressure is really on him. And not a lot of them can take it. And in this time, particularly at this period of time, a lot of these born-again Jews were going back to worship in the temple. They were, uh, they were uh, going back to the Old Testament type of worship. And uh, we're saying, well, we're still worshiping the, the true God. And this was not acceptable to God. For this has now been abrogated. This has been re replaced. God has finished with that. And so uh, he calls them back to uh, worship uh, to, to, to the New Testament church, which is not for the purpose of worship at all. In fact, the 10th chapter begins, as he says, I am not pleased with sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and, whole, uh, and uh, uh, whole, uh, uh, other things like that. I, I, I really do not take pleasure in those things. Uh, those, were, those were done as a picture to point to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Once he came, those things don't have any meaning whatsoever. Now, as... The uh, plan goes as the, um, the uh, time goes on. They, they're going back. And so Hebrews is written to say to these people, you've got to stop this. And in chapter 10, verse 25, he gives them this warning. Uh, he says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Now what he's referring to, of course, is the local church. The word for forsaking is... Uh, in the Greek is this word. It's a three-part uh, uh, compound word, egg, which is the same as ek, but you can't have two Ks together, so you, uh, it becomes a G. E-G-K-A-T-A-L-E-I-P-O. Uh, this is the preposition of ultimate source. Kata is the preposition of norm and standard. It sometimes takes the connotation of down uh, with the idea of uh, uh, rejection. Lipo means to leave or to forsake, to abandon. And so this word is talking about uh, abandoning or uh, uh, leaving down according to, from the ultimate source, uh, and uh, therefore it has the constitution, uh, the the the, uh, the concept of uh, not just uh, forsaking, uh, but uh, of uh, abandoning uh, completely, uh, of uh, uh, actually uh, defection is the word because. It's uh, much stronger than simply abandoning or leaving or forsaking, but it's defection uh, together with the negative, uh, uh, which in a present, uh, with the, plus the negative, says that they should stop doing something that they were already doing. 
So he is saying this, stop your defection uh, from what? What are they defecting? What are they, uh, what are they turning their back on? Well, the assembling of yourself together. The assembling of yourselves is a word we've already looked at in relationship to the word church, but it's not ecclesia. It looks like this. It's a compound of uh, the word we've already looked at. E-P-I is the preposition, S-U-N-A-G-O-G-E, sunagoge, from which we get the English word transliterated, synagogue. And synagogue does mean to assemble. That's where we get the, uh, the word for where the Jews meet is called a synagogue, an assembly place, sunagoge. Uh, here, uh, uh, with the uh, preposition, Epi, which is the preposition for fullness, uh, it is uh, the, the, the fully gathering together. And it was uh, a description of what the local church was doing. The local church was gathering together for the purpose of learning, for the purpose of educating. See, the synagogue came into existence during the previous administration of the fifth cycle of discipline, under the Chaldean Empire, when Babylon came down uh, and took the Jews captivity and brought them back to, the, to their uh, homeland, they left behind uh, the ruins of their the, Solomon's temple. Well, you just couldn't build a temple anywhere. That was, that was, God said the temple can only be in one place. So what they did was, in their captivity, they built assembly places synagogues, uh, synagogue, and they, they didn't worship in those places because the only one place to worship for the Jew was the temple. It was the place of, to gather to study the Torah, and the Torah was the original manuscripts of the Old Testament uh, law uh, and, and, and the prophets. So they had the law and the prophets, and they had some of the writings, the threefold division of the Old Testament. And they would; these were in scroll form, and they would get them out, and they would read them, and in reading them, then they would uh, study them. And so, it's a perfect word to use to describe the principle of the local church as a gathering place for the study of the Word of God. And there is no substitute for it. Home Bible classes are not a substitute for the local church. Uh, a tape recorder is not a substitute for a local church. Uh, a television or radio is not a substitute for a local church. There are many people who, re who will not go to church and they'll fill it in with uh, a tape recorder or they'll fill it in with a, uh, uh, a television. Uh, we have people in our congregation who are very, very lax about their attendance at church because they can always make it up at a, from, a, from a, 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 a picking up a tape. And that's wrong. That is wrong. When you can be at Bible class and you make a choice because that it's more convenient for you to, uh, to pick it up by means of, uh, of a tape, then you're out of line. Uh, the only reason you use a tape is when it's unavoidable for you. Or you're, uh, for example, we have people who on uh, Tuesday and Thursday nights are teaching in our, uh, in, our, uh, in our prep school program. And it is our policy. This is our policy. Anybody who works in the prep school program listens to tapes. And if you do not, you do not teach in prep school, period. That is a rule, has been in this church for 24 years, has never changed, will always remain the same. Any teacher who teaches in any of our schools will be listening to tapes so that they will know what is being taught from the pulpit. And if they're not listening to tapes, then they're not teaching in the prep school. They're not working in the kids' club. That's the rule. It will always be that way as long as I'm pastor of this church. Because the teaching in the prep school must reflect the teaching from this sacred desk. And if you don't know what's being taught from this sacred desk, one, you're not growing spiritually yourself. If you're not growing spiritually, how dare you have the arrogance to think that you can lead anybody else. You can't lead anybody else to some place you've never been. How can you lead someone spiritually to a place that you aren't by saying, you go there? No, you say, you come here. 
You lead the way. That's what a leader is all about, whether that leader is a, an adult, a captain, or a junior leader, a co-captain. You're leading boys and girls, and you're saying, come to my spiritual level. And if you don't have a spiritual level except that of the gutter, how can you lead anybody? You can't lead anybody out from something and say, go that way. That's not leadership. A signpost can do that. Leadership is to be a spiritual giant and saying, come along and become a part of it. You're, a spiritual, uh, adva you're spiritually adv advanced. You're moving on. And there's only one way to do that. The Word of God and the Word of God that's being taught to you. And if you can't be in class sitting down under the teaching face to face, then you can, you can augment it with the tapes. But it's not meant ever to be a substitute. It's, I, it's, I don't know who gets tapes, so don't, understand, don't misunderstand me. I do not know who gets tapes. I never sneak back there and look to see whose tapes are waiting. That's not my business. I, I don't look to know that. I don't have any idea. Who gets or does not get tapes? I know one person who gets them because I hear them around the house all the time. And it's not me. Uh, where I walk past the door of uh, uh, her room when she's getting ready to go in the morning, uh, and there's, there I hear a familiar voice uh, ranting and raving over something. Uh, but uh, it's mine. Uh, hmm, is that me? Did I say that? I should well, I'd be more quiet and more gentle when I get to class. And I did not forget it when I get here. But the point is that only the local church is ordained by God and it's ordained for face-to-face -face teaching God didn't send say send a tape recorder into all the world that's, I mean if that's the way to do it why not just send tapes everywhere make a lot of tapes and put them all over that's not the issue see face-to-face -face is, is the predominant way that God wants you to get the Word of God that's why he's ordained the spiritual gift of pastor teacher. But uh, uh, and there are people who flit from church to church, like from flower to flower. You know how it is, looking for what they want to hear. We call them dilettantes. You know, that's a new word for you. Learn what a dilettante is. A dilettante is a person who picks out something that they want to hear, and then they go to find the church where it is. It used to be prophecy. I don't know if it, what it is anymore today. It might be uh, something else, but it was always prophecy. And they'd be looking, they, and uh, they'd go to Saturday's paper, and they, all the, the churches would advertise what they're going to do. And if there was going to be anybody with a big chart on the wall, ah, oh, I'll be there. And they'll sit there uh, with mouth open. Maybe today it's, uh, there was a time when it was also music. Who's going to have a quartet? Who's going to have a choir? Who's going to have somebody special to entertain me? I will be there in that church uh, to, to get that. Well, amazing to see what people want. Okay. whatever it is you're looking for. The point is, you don't flip from church to church as the bee goes from flower to flower, seeking some sort of sweetness and move on. As a matter of fact, the, uh, you don't even know what's good for you. You see, God, the Holy Spirit, knows what you're going to be facing in the future. And what He does is, He provides that for you in advance by moving the pastor teacher to communicate the Word of God so that he gives you something that you're going to need in the next period of time. That's why word by word, verse by verse exegesis is so important. See, I'm not jumping from topic to topic to topic to topic. I'm taking the Word of God word by word, verse by verse. If every word is inspired of God, then every word is important. We take every word, we study it, and we keep on moving. When we come to a topic, introduced by a subject, then we go into it. Now, I was tempted. I came, we're, we're in Galatians chapter 1, verse 2. Uh, Paul writes to the churches at Galatia. And I had already uh, written uh, the, the commentary that I've done, and I said in the commentary that we're not spending any time on the church. We're going to go and uh, spend it on Galatia. But we will put the doctrine of the church into an appendix. And after I had written that and had it all finished and moved on to chapter, to verse 3, grace, and had gotten 15 or 20 pages written in grace, I became aware of the fact that I cannot skip the word church just because, to me, it was extremely familiar. 
So I had to say that when I come to it in the, in the exegesis, in the congregation, I will spend enough time to communicate what God is doing. Now I'm skipping some things like the seven analogies of the church. That'll be in the, in the book. There are a few other things that I'm skipping, but there are no, so many important things that need to be repeated that I decided, regardless of the fact, that I would like to skip over it and get on. I can hardly wait to get to grace, don't you see? I'm just dying to get to grace. But it just has to wait its time because I must teach you word by word, line upon line, precept upon precept. And I don't have the right to say I'll skip over church because I'm so familiar with it. And, uh, but the congregation needs it. And uh, I'm convicted by uh, the several passages that talk about repetition. So the local church is God's ordained method. And he says, do not forsake the assembling of your, your, uh, yourselves together. Now, what is the organization of the local church? Turn in your Bible to Philippians chapter 1. We've looked at it before, but we'll look at it one more time. In this study, at least. Lewis Berry Chafer said, quote, Organization is wisdom's first step for a people associated together in a common cause. But organization is for a purpose and therefore is not a purpose itself. These wise words have been unheeded by many, if not most, in the organized church today. Or is, should be minimal as, minimal as possible in order to get the job done. Now, I'm going to refer to a number of passages uh, that are found in the Word of Beginning with Philippians 1. Now, notice what it says as Paul addresses this church. Paul and Timothy 2. Uh, now, we have three designations. We have saints. We have uh, together with what? Together with the overseers if you're reading it from the New International and deacons now there you have the fact that all believers are saints now we don't go around calling each other saints we don't have special saints designated by a group of people from a church saying that these people are saints uh, the word for saint, which is found in the Greek, is very, very simple. Uh, uh, it's the word uh, hagias. Looks like this in the Greek. H a g i o s. So we get a lot of words from this. We get holy, uh, holiness, but sanctify, sanctification. The word simply means set apart. That's all the word means. Set apart, in the case of anything that is religious, it is set apart for God, usually. But it may be set apart in the Old Testament. Some things were set apart for the priests to use. Some were set apart for the Levites to use. Some things were set apart for God. But set apart for God. All believers are set apart for God. This, therefore, refers to the congregation of the local church. And, beloved, there's nothing higher than the local congregation. However, the local congregation extends an invitation to a man who is to become the overseer, which introduces us to the second word. We've already seen it be in the past. It looks like this. Pardon me. E-P-I-S-K-O-P-O-S. Skapas. epi skapas. Skapas means to... To, to see or to overlook, or to, to look or to see, and epi means upon, so you have someone who sees upon or looks upon. Uh, the word refers, of course, to the one who uh, oversees, and it is a, one of the words for pastor. We've seen the other word, presbyteros, elder or old men, and another one, penas, which is the shepherd, and then didaskalos, which is the teacher. But here we have the, uh, the, the description of the pastor. Then we have the third word, which is this one. D-I-A-K-O-N-O-S. 
These, the word simply means to stir up the dust. Jan told me, she said, I am a deacon today, the other day. She was cleaning the bedroom, and she was stirring up the dust. And I, she was right. She was absolutely right. The word means to stir up the dust, and it is a word for servant. Sometimes it is even used of the pastor in his work as a servant. Now, these are the three uh, divisions of the local church. You'll notice uh, that uh, uh, the pastor is, is not called, in this case, the elder. But he is in other places, presbyteros. But the, the, there's no plurality of elders in a local congregation. Plurality of elders is a, a, a carryover from the Plymouth Brethren in which they do not have a pastor, teacher, but they have a plurality of elders, and one of the elders will have the spiritual gift of communication, and he will be the communicating elder. Then you'll have a ruling elder, or uh, you may have other kinds of elders. Okay, and uh, uh, these elders are all ordained. That is a man-made uh, organization. It is not the organization from God. As a matter of fact, I was interested to note uh, Chester McCauley, who is the pastor of uh, uh, Beth Haven Church in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, and a former teacher at uh, um, Columbia Bible College, who is uh, very uh, uh, active in the uh, uh, categorical teaching movement, uh, has written a series, and he says this, quote, Deacons have no ruling authority. I was surprised. Deacons have no ruling authority. The very word means servant, and servants take orders. They do not give them. The greatest service a deacon can render is to help create the kind of atmosphere in, which, in the church that will be conducive to edification through the teaching of the Word of God. He should be ever alert to that which he can do to enhance and preserve this priority. Only when this is done can he say he has truly served. Furthermore, he makes an interesting statement. He says, In no place do we find either pastors or deacons formed into what we know as a board or committee. Whether in a nation or in a church, there are always great leaders, but there are never great committees. No one can find a committee finding and no one can find a committee finding a place in the Hall of Fame. Unfortunately, the church is structured off after corporate America. Another thing he make, he says, a practical comment, operation of a local church democratic rule makes one fatal assumption. That that fatal assumption is this, that the majority of the church is spiritually mature. Rule by a majority is inevitably the rule of carnality. This is unfortunate, but in most cases, it is true. And that's exactly right. Uh, I was very uh, interested to note in the second passage that we're going to be talking about, uh, uh, in, uh, that uh, in Acts chapter 6, that, uh, and this is a familiar passage to you, turn with, it, with me to, uh, to it, please. Now, you, if you have a, perhaps a Schofield reference Bible or a Bible that has uh, in it titles, remember that the titles are not in the original. In the Schofield reference Bible, he, he, uh, Schofield has said, this is the first deacons. However, I have looked through this passage and I do not find the word deacon at all in the sixth chapter. At all, uh, it's not found there. It's just not in that passage. And whether they were the first deacons or not, we don't know. But we do know the one thing about Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7, is the, that there was administration which was necessary, and the purpose is given very clearly. You see what happens here, in, in notice chapter 6, uh, Acts 6, 1. As there were an increase in the number of disciples, pardon me, there was a complaint between the Greek-speaking Jews and the Aramaic-speaking Jews. Now, the early church was made up as, as strictly of Jews, but there, during the dispersion, after the, uh, the, the dispersion we talked about when the Chaldeans came in and took the Jews, uh, uh, many of them remained throughout the, the uh, empire. Well, following the Chaldean Empire, we have the takeover of the Medes and the Persians. 
And following that, the, the Grecian Empire took over, and the language of the world became Greek. And some of these Jews who were all over the world, ne they never learned their, their, their own language. They never learned Hebrew and Aramaic. They spoke only Greek. That's the reason that there is an, a, a publication which is called the Septuagint. That was uh, the Hebrew Old Testament translated into Greek so that these Greek-speaking Jews all over the world would be able to have the Scripture that they could, uh, they could read. And then it was Septuagint because it uh, was translated by the 70. There were 72, but I don't know why. I guess there's no word for 72. But anyway, uh, the Septuagint, Sept comes from seven. Uh, you have the, the 70. It was translated by 70 people from the Hebrew into the Greek. And, and when we study the Old Testament... It's always wise for us not only to study the Hebrew, but to study the Greek translation, the Septuagint, because it's important for us to understand how did these men translate this passage of Scripture from the Hebrew back at the time uh, of the Hellenistic Empire. They were a lot closer to it than we. And so how did they translate it? And so when we're, when we're working in the Hebrew Old Testament, we always check the translation in the Septuagint so that we know what the Old Testament was translated like. But now we come to the early church, and people are born again. Some of those that were born again on the day of Pentecost, having come from all over the world, didn't speak Hebrew or Aramaic. They spoke only Greek. Now they're born again. They're part of the local church. And some of the Aramaic-speaking Jews are part of the local church. And some of these in the local church are widows. Now, in the early part of the church, they did some things which were necessary. Notice what it says, that the, the widows were overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Now, the early church had the responsibility to distribute food. This did not last. They did not have all things common into the church period, but at the very beginning, when uh, uh, this uh, massive influx of people came and uh, were there, needed eating food, the, it was responsibility to distribute food to these people. But what happened was, these was not getting their share. It was only to the Jewish uh, widows, say, they said. So, and who was doing it? Well, the, the twelve, uh, the apostles, Matthias, were doing it, verse 2. So they gathered all the students, disciples, students together, and said this. Here is the principle of organization. It's not right for us to neglect ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. There is the principle. And it's a, it's, it's a very important principle. See, there are many things that I could do in the local church. I will not do because of this verse. And because of this principle, I can mow the grass, but see, this verse tells me I cannot neglect the Word of God to do that. I can paint walls. The Word of God tells me I cannot do that in order to devote myself to the Word of God. There are many things that could be that I can do. I mean, any idiot can do some of those things. Uh, the cleaning of the church, I could do that. And there are pastors who do that. However... If I'm going to be obedient to what the Word of God says, I must not neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables or to do the work that needs to be done around the church. So he says this in verse 3. They say this, Brethren, fellow members of the royal family, choose seven men from among you, and then gives the requirements who are full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom. Th then it says, We will turn this responsibility, that is, the waiting on the tables, over to them, and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word of God. And then they went on uh, and they chose. And it's interesting to note that all seven that they chose were Hebrew-speaking uh, uh, Jews. They didn't choose any Greek-speaking Jews to minister to the Greeks. Too bad. But they, 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 it worked out. But you see what it says in verse 7? Because of good administration, what happens? The word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and even a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. That is the result of good 
administration in the local church. Administration is absolutely necessary. And our church is based in its administrative uh, policies upon that. Though we do have a board, the board doesn't meet except in nece necessary occasions, which is maybe once a year, if, uh, if then. Uh, we, basically what it is, is each deacon is assigned a particular area of responsibility, and that area of responsibility is the area in which they function. And as long as they're functioning well, they don't need to, to have a meeting. And besides, what, uh, say the deacon in charge of tapes, uh, 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 how, how will uh, uh, discussion of, of the tapes uh, help the deacon who is in charge of uh, the parking lot, let's say, or the facilities? Or, uh, see, we don't need uh, this. This is a waste of time, and it's meetings upon meetings upon meetings, and meetings never accomplish much. Somebody said a committee is a group of people who know nothing, who are elected to do nothing. Well, that may be the case. Uh, but uh, if each man has his area of responsibility, is given a job description, he knows what he's supposed to do, and he consults with the president of the corporation, which is the pastor teacher, and they together coordinate what they're supposed to do. The church has smooth function. The pastor teacher gives himself to the communication of the word of God, and it works. Now we're going to see the word elders in Acts chapter 14. Paul and Barnabas are on their first missionary journey. The churches have been founded and they're on there they're going to return to these original churches in verse 21. What do they do? They return to the churches at Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples. And so we have the word strengthening. We have the word encouraging. These are two things that they were able to do. But they strengthened and they encouraged these men. Uh, but then they did something else. They said in verse 23, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church. It really says elders in the churches and committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. Now, what did they do? Well, the word is kairotoneo. Uh, looks like this. Let me take a clean sheet here. I think that is O. C H E I R O. Get the word chiropractic from this word. Chiro meaning the hand, manipulation by the hand. Uh, chirotoneo, T O N E O. Chirotoneo means to, uh, to vote by stretching forth the hand, to appoint, or to delegate responsibility. They delegated responsibility. The apostles recognized in the local church someone who had the spiritual gift and made them to be presbyteros. P-R-E-S-B-U-T-E-R-O-S. -E presbyteros. For them is in the ta in the date of advantage. It was to the advantage of the local church to have these presbyteros, elder. And we've studied the word elder, and uh, uh, so much that we don't need to talk about it uh, again. Now let's look over to Acts chapter 20. You see there the organization. The churches have to be organized. This idea of uh, uh, just a group of people meeting together is not biblical. But in Acts chapter 20, um, beginning in verse 17, we have from Miletus. Now, Miletus was an island off the coast. Uh, Paul sent to Ephesus. And he, for, for whom? He says he sent for the elders of the churches. Here we have presbyteros, you see? So this group of people is first of called elders. But the same group of people is the ones to whom he speaks. He gets them there, and he begins to speak to them. 
And um, he tells them about what he had done while he was there. Verse 19, I served the Lord while I was with you in humility, with tears, through great trials, uh, through the plots of the Jews. Nevertheless, I kept back nothing uh, that was profitable for you, but declared it uh, to both Jews and Greeks. Uh, and uh, from house to house, it means from church to church, because the, the, house, the church is met in house. I did, I did it publicly. I did it from church to church. Paul had that, uh, that ministry. Now he says, I'm going to Jerusalem. And then he, then he gets down to verse 25. Uh, now I know that none of you among whom I have been preaching the kingdom of God will ever see me again. Therefore, I'm declaring to you that I am innocent from the blood of all men. For, for verse 20, I have not stated to proclaim to you the whole counsel of God. So the entire counsel of God. Uh, the word that is translated will of God is not a bad translation, but the word is bulamai, which looks like this. And it is the and determined will of God and should have a stronger translation. You have uh, thelo and bulamai. Thelo is a will which proceeds from the emotions. Bulamai which proceeds, is the will which proceeds from a settled, declared uh, uh, mandate. And so we, we translate this counsel, the whole counsel of God. A little bit more. Uh, God from his determined account crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, uh, what, uh, very quickly now. Uh, he says, I have not declared unto you the whole counsel of God. Now verse 28. Keep watch over yourselves and the flock of God of which the Holy Spirit has made you what? Overseers. There's the second word. Overseers. And we've already seen that. That is the word episkopos. Same people who were called, uh, were called elders presburas are now here called overseers. But he goes on. What does he say the next word? Be shepherds. Now the word is poimenas. So here we have the third word, P-O-I-M-E-N. Uh, this is the A-A-S. A -A so you have the three words, elders, overseers, shepherds, which describe the work of pastor. They're called three different things in this one passage. So he appoints them. Now the episcopas, uh, the foreman uh, of a Christian crew in the original Greek, supervisor of construction. Uh, Thayer says, a man should the duty, seeing the thing be done by others, are done rightly. Did you get that? A man who is charged with the duty of seeing the things to be done by others are done The character of the work of the pastor teacher is described as word, the charge of the spiritual life of the church. The shepherd means that he feeds, he guards, he protects, he, he does what's necessary in this local church. And so you have the organization of local church. Another passage in Acts 27, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12, and 13, Thessalonians 5, 17, 1 Corinthians uh, 9, 4, and other passages which are related to this. Uh, but uh, we have here the principle of the fact believers uh, in a local assembly are organized, and the one who is the overseer, the uh, episcopaler, the uh, poimenus, the shepherd, uh, is over this. And uh, this is the responsibility of uh, of a local church to be organized minimally as possible to get the job done and I think that that's very easy to fail to do uh, by getting overly organized have too many people trying to do too many things but when you uh, when you assign responsibility remember this the pastor teacher is not without accountability he is accountable to the local congregation first but above everything else he is accountable to God and when he fails he receives triple compound divine discipline from God. Three times as much as any believer gets, the pastor gets when he screws up. So don't think we're without uh, someone who oversees us. Absolutely not. The God of the universe, the gracious God, expects certain things of us, and we have that responsibility because one day we shall stand before the Bema seat of Christ to give an account of our service for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And never ask, how big was your church? It always is, have you been faithful to teach the Word of God? Now thank you, Father, for your grace, for the teaching of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit glorify God the Son. In Jesus' name, amen. What? Is that the man of...